I would without hesitation say do ortho because... Hello everyone, welcome back. This is episode six of the video podcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Jenny Jun. She is a practicing orthodontist in Southern California. She graduated from NYU Dental School and then she finished up her orthodontic residency at UCLA. Today, she gives us a little insight into her life and tells us a little bit of what it's like to be an orthodontist. She also gives us some great life advice as well, so stay tuned. I hope you guys enjoy this video podcast. And if you haven't heard of Dr. Jenny Jen before, she's also on YouTube and has her own YouTube channel, so definitely go check her out. All right, and now onto the video. So I'm a board certified orthodontist in LA and I'm practicing here under an orthodontist right now, four to five days a week. And I went to NYU for the seven year dental program, UCLA for the ortho program. And I was actually born in Korea, came to Southern California when I was eight. And an interesting fact about me is that I grew up uh, without my parents since the age of 11. So I basically studied abroad since I was 11 here in America. Wow, that is very interesting. So I also saw from some of your other videos, so if you guys, if this is your first time meeting Dr. Jenny Jung, you should check out her other videos because there's a lot of them out there and they're super helpful. So I learned in one of them or in a couple of them that your mom was also an orthodontist. Was she an orthodontist in, in Korea? Yeah, she's in Korea, which is why I don't work with her now. Yeah. Parents are still in Korea and you're basically yeah. living your own life here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is orthodontics in Korea very different than it is here? Or were you able to get some guidance on the yeah. world of orthodontics here since your mom practiced in Korea? Yeah. So actually, I didn't know this when I was growing up, but Korea is like at the forefront of orthodontics like they are the ones that came up with tads and they're doing a lot of like complex orthodontics and things like that so like my mom was doing tads on me when I was a high schooler and oh, then wow. yeah and then I come to residency and they're like oh this is a new thing and I was like oh I had that when I was little <laughs> so that's so um, funny Definitely, there's a lot of good things that come from mixing different cultures within orthodontics because there's like different techniques and different approaches. Okay, speaking of techniques and approaches, mm -hmm. is there things that you learned in residency that you definitely don't practice now, such as TADS? So I don't do TADS currently because of the practice that I work at. The practice that I work at is very high volume, very fast paced, um, things like that. And so it's a little bit harder to incorporate TADS in a practice like that because it, it requires a lot of doctor time. And so if you're stuck with one patient do, like drilling in the TAD, then you're gonna be backed up with so many other patients. It seems not as efficient. Right. So it depends on the practice, what techniques you get to practice. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So tell us a little bit about this high volume practice. I yeah. saw on your Instagram story one time that you had like 14 chairs or something. Honestly, like when I came to this practice, I was like, how is this even possible? Because it's literally a mega office. And there's a lot of reasons why I actually ended up working there. And um, in the beginning, I just picked it up as a job because there was an opening. But then I was working that job and another job in a smaller uh, private practice. Um, it was for maternity leave. And so I was just covering for that doctor. But I really liked how this particular office was run because of the efficiency of the systems. And then also the fact that the assistants were really well trained. So then when you combine those two things with a lot of patients it, and, and, and also like you have to be a good orthodontist in order to like manage all that so that it's a good system. When I combined all those, I was like, wait, this is the formula to be able to help as many people as possible. It's like maximizing my talent. Um, and so that, and then also I just really love the culture there. Um, I don't know if if you like ever see all my stories but like we do like baby showers and like birthdays and like all the time like and we dress up for holidays and they're really good about that and so it's just all of those things combined really made me just want to work here 
and so I only work here now <laughs> actually okay. full yeah. time yeah full time I'm glad to hear that you enjoy your job that you yeah. enjoy working there that's yeah. good is it normal to work Saturdays and is it normal to work like five days a week for an orthodontist or as you get more experience you're going to work maybe four days a week or three days a week so it really depends on how much you want to work because you get to determine your lifestyle just by how what you want it to be so so there are some people that work you know three days a month four days a month and they're okay <laughs> because maybe their you know husband or wife works and that can compensate for it and also if you have a private practice of your own in the very beginning you may not be practicing all all of the days of the month because you don't have enough patients to start with so then um, you wouldn't have as many days or as at least as not as many days seeing patients there could be like non-ortho days where they do administrative work so the statistic that I've heard is orthodontists usually work three days a week which is totally possible I know people who do that but I think for many people who want to maximize their income they do work more since you mentioned income doing ortho residency after dental school is really expensive do you think it's worth it for someone that's going to pay for ortho residency and pay for dental school nowadays with inflation and everything now that you've been working and with everything you know do you think it's still worth it or would you recommend people like think about a little bit more I would without hesitation say do ortho because there's so many different reasons well only if you think you can get a good orthodontic education because if you are a bad orthodontist that might be the worst nightmare ever because you aren't married to the patient as long as you mm-hmm. own your own practice, you're almost married to that patient. So let's say you aren't able to deliver on the things that you promise, then it's a nightmare. But if you are a good one and you go through a proper training where they where you understand the mechanics of how to move teeth, then yeah, it's it's amazing because you don't work as much. It's not as physically tiring but then you you get compensated way more. And um, you don't necessarily work on patients for as long procedures as like other specialties do. So it's a lot better on your physical health. Yeah, so you can work for a lot longer, like longevity Uh, because of your physical health. And then for someone who goes to dental school, pays a lot for dental school and pays a lot for ortho residency, how long on average do you think it would take to pay off their loans? So I think that's really dependent on like how aggressively you pay back your loans because okay. some of my friends who have paid back their loans and it's like maybe five years out, they're done. And I'm, I know some people who have paid it off in like four years and well, just like the residency part, um, their dental school is like another, uh, another portion, but um and there are others who just keep keep it going because interest is low Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of different approaches um so I think there's not like one clear answer to that okay well it's good to know that you're not recommending not doing ortho because ortho residency is expensive you're always going to be making money so I don't think money should be the reason why you shouldn't do or don't do anything For the future, is your goal to have your own practice or do you plan on associating for longer? What are your thoughts for the future? So I do want to open my own practice one day. Right now, I really like where I am. And uh, I just know that the system that I work in is so good. And so I do want to work here for a little bit longer, at least. Um, I think my priority is to first get like my personal life in order. So like get married, maybe like have a couple kids or something. But like, <laughs> um, definitely that's like my priority right now. Um, because I know a lot of people who focus too much on the career and, and their personal lives become, you know, on the back burner. So I I really don't want that ha- to happen. And like, yeah. we working and studying for the for so long so 
yeah I just feel like sometime like I yeah I just reflected and I was like I, I need to shift my priorities a little bit yeah that's good that you realize that though because no. you've been doing school your entire life and then it's just like work 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 so it's good that you like took a step back and realized what you need what are some from what you know what are some different types of ortho practices to go from like the smallest to biggest or there's also other categories but um, generally there's like the private office where there's only one doctor um, and that's if you open your own and then there's a slightly bigger one where you know there might be one location or multiple locations and there's one doctor and there's like associate doctors be below that and then um, the step further is there's like way more locations than just a couple so there may might be like seven to twenty you know so then mm -hmm. usually those offices um, are a little bit more corporate structure so um, there will be a lot of assistants or a lot of employees and, you know, there's like marketing teams around them and all this stuff. It's almost like a DSO, um, although there, so there's an OSO that are basically specializing uh, as ortho, but the same thing as DSO. They are basically more, they do have like the business side of the owners and then they have the dental side and dentist side of the owners. Um, but they're mostly more owned by more financial people. Mm -hmm. and, financial people. Um, and then there's also like kind of sort of DSOs that are owned solely by orthodontists, like orthodontists that run like so many offices. Mm -hmm. um, so that is kind of like an OSO too, but or owned by an orthodontist. And then there's the other spectrum of like community uh, clinics as well, like under hospitals, um, usually the more community service hospitals. Um, and then there's also the academic, which is, you know, you just go in as a faculty, full-time faculty, you do research and you see some patients um, and you teach. Okay, so definitely many routes you can go into. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about OSOs going into dental school there's a lot of people would say like don't do corporate things like um, that it really depends because I think the most important thing is what is the owner like what is the CEO of the company like because that mm -hmm. really dictates the culture of that company um, let's say the CEO is like uh, only wants money and doesn't really care about the ethics of treatment then they would might want you to treat start patients and put on braces on patients that already have cavities or something or that don't even need treatment. Um, and so there definitely are practices out there and it doesn't have to be a DSO. It can even be a private practice that does that. Um, and so because DSOs tend to be run by financial people and they do put that as like a value into what they're looking for. Um, I think that's why they get that bad reputation. But there are definitely some branches where it's owned by, you know, better people that really care about patients that mm -hmm. actually do a really good job, even if they may be DSOs. Yeah. Well, good to know. When you first graduated from UCLA, how did you start your job search? Did you get like reps coming in saying we need orthodontists here and orthodontists here or like friends, like word of mouth? Yeah. How did, how did you begin establishing yourself as a new orthodontist? Yeah. And okay. you've been working for two years now, correct? Two, yeah. Two and a half, a little more than two and a half. Uh, so I remember when I was starting my search, I think it was probably April of my last year in residency. And I remember in the very beginning, I was pretty nervous because some people always say, oh, it's so saturated in Southern California. It's super hard to find jobs. Um, and so I was buying into that. And so I was like, do I go to Santa Rosa? Like, do I go to like NorCal? I even went to go, go um, shadow in Santa Rosa, which is NorCal to like potentially go work there. And I don't even mm -hmm. know but because I just thought I was like in that scarcity mindset of, oh, there's no jobs here. Um, but so what had happened was 
I was starting to tell all my attendings, hey, I'm like gonna stay here. Um, if you know anyone, like let me know. And then one attending was like, oh, there's a there's an orthodontist who's always looking for orthodontists to hire. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And she was like, oh, it's Dr. Lily. And I was like, okay, that's so I just like banked that in the back of my mind and I just wrote it on my notes. And then uh, about a week later, uh, a um, a a rep from American Ortho reached out to me, and he and I were pretty close because he came to our residency pretty frequently, and like mm -hmm. every time I see him, like I would you know greet him, and the the sales reps I think they really appreciate that because they come to the residency and they're like it could be a little bit awkward you know because it's not where they are you know totally belonged technically and so um because I think we had that report he was like oh you know there's a job opening um would you like to apply and I was like yes of course and and then I like made that connection between like oh we might attending work for her oh wait th this is the op job opportunity that I have and so I interviewed and then my attending was like okay you have to just take that job like don't even negotiate just go for it and so that's what I did I just like blindly like went for it um and then so they offered a lot of days actually so it was three and a half days uh per week so it was Monday Wednesday Friday every other Saturday um and so I was like wow this is gonna fill up my schedule already so that was good and then I picked up another job which was Tuesday Thursday and then every other Saturday so basically I was working six days a week for the first five months or something like that. Did you um, get burnt out at all for, oh, from working yeah. so much? 100%. Like six days a week is crazy. You don't even have time to do laundry. Like, <laughs> and you, your house becomes a mess because you just come home and you're like, you're just a vegetable. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, And I've heard like from other friends, like I'm graduating my residency program soon. It's a general practice residency and yeah. my co-residents are going to, some of them are going to work six days a week. And I'm like, isn't that a lot? And they said, that's pretty normal for like a new dentist. Oh, I'm like, wow. oh, I didn't know that. Or I feel like that's too much. That's a lot, especially for general dentistry. It's must be really taxing on your back and everything. Yeah, no, it definitely is. I definitely feel it in my back. So, I mean, I didn't really feel it in my back until maybe like last month or so, or last two weeks or so. And I think it was probably because of like some of my workouts, plus the fact that I didn't work out in the morning before I went to, to work. Oh, but working out in the morning before you go to work, is so crucial. So Do you crucial. shower after? <laughs> Yeah, like I just like I don't sweat that much from the workouts usually. And so I just like like my hair I can't I can't wash it because then I like it's going to take too long, but then like my face down, yeah. I'll wash and then I'll go. Yeah. But it makes such a huge difference because your core is is engaged the whole day. Whereas if you don't, then your back just takes the toll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's some good life advice. Oh yeah. <laughs> what are some of your favorite procedures to do? Mm. Do you like braces, Invisalign, or other yeah. ortho appliances? So, what's your favorite, and what do you do most of? I do mostly braces and clear aligners. I mean, I don't think in orthodontics there's like that many choices of of appliances per se and like it's not like we expand everyone nor do we like put on class twos on their class two appliances on any, everyone you know but I do really miss using tads because there's a lot that you can do with it and in certain cases like okay so here's just like a little intro about orthodontics just so that you can understand what I'm saying so okay I'm ready <laughs> okay so moving teeth is kind of like moving boats in water. So the tooth itself, it moves through the bone, right? So the root is embedded in the bone and you move it through the bone. The bone, it, it remodels, right? So that's mm -hmm. how it, and the bigger the root, the harder it is to move, right? Okay. So 
imagine like a big molar that's like a big ship in the water imagine like an incisor that's like a smaller ship in the water and then mm -hmm. in, imagine like a lower incisor that's like a little boat mm -hmm. yeah so so then when you move teeth you you pit like these little boats against the big boats so that you can move the little boats closer to the big boats the big boats will move a little bit but usually the smaller boats will move but then there are some times where you need to move the bigger ships toward the smaller ship smaller boats that's when you need tads or if you want to move a lot of small ships but then this ship isn't gonna isn't gonna hold against all of these smaller ships then the, uh, the big ship is gonna start moving right mm -hmm. so so then that's when you want a tad because a tad is like an anchor so you literally like like have a screw anchored down into land right into the, mm -hmm. the bottom of the ocean or into bone and that thing doesn't move theoretically sometimes it does move a little bit but or it can move and it also can fail mm -hmm. <laughs> meaning it can become loose and come out um, but if you have something like an anchor like that then you can literally move teeth anywhere theoretically as long as it's within bone mm -hmm. yeah and so that allows you to do a lot more things than just being restricted by having these like big ships small ship you know things like that so since you can't use a tad at yeah. your current practice because it like you have to see so many patients how do you get around that is it just longer treatment time with like wires and brackets so yeah that's a good question so um, most of the time, if the patient, the cases are not super duper complex, you don't need, um, you don't need TADS. I think these days there are some practices that overuse TADS too. Mm -hmm. Like you don't necessarily need it, but like, okay, so let's say the patient doesn't want extractions, but they're bimax protrusive, meaning their upper and lower teeth are flared forward. Okay. Then you, instead of extracting premolars, you could, in some cases, uh, put on tads and just push the entire complex backwards. It takes mm. way longer to do that, though. And also, there are some limitations because the, it's limited by how much space you have back here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in some cases, you don't have enough space to do that even, but if like the, the patient, let's say, really doesn't want extractions, then they could potentially do that. A lot of times when you throw in tans, it becomes a lot more complex. And when you throw in complexity, it's less predictable. And when it's less predictable, there's way more possibilities that something can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. So, yeah. It's all those things. Anything else that you miss doing that you are not doing now? That you learned in school um so there is one thing and i really like surgical orthodontics so what that is is when when orthodontists collaborate with oral surgeons to do jaw surgery and okay. i we still do that but i think the demographic of of the patients that i serve um they are less inclined to want jaw surgery and so okay. the often just go for a compromise where their bite may not be ideal, um, but they're satisfied because they're bet in a better situation than they were before. Yeah. Do you think yeah. it's because like insurance won't cover the surgery or they just don't want to get teeth taken out? It's, it's kind of both. Um, so sometimes they don't have to take, te get teeth taken out, but um, the thought of jaw surgery like breaking yeah. the jaw and like putting it back together like that is you know fearful for them um, yeah I would be fearful for myself if I had to do yeah. that too yeah so and, and it is a big procedure and there are risks to it um such as like paresthesia and you know other things so um 
Yeah, but it's really life changing when the patient mm-hmm. really needs it because the jaw is so discrepant, class two or class three, or like asymmetries. Um, and then they get it, and it's just life changing because it's not only aesthetic, but it's also functional. I see. So now that you've been practicing for two and a half years, what is not to put you on the spot or anything, but what's like the biggest thing you've learned? There's so many things that I learned. I think this could also fall under some of the advice that I can give to people that want to be orthodontists. Because yeah, I think I see this a lot, not only in orthodontics, but like just regularly in life. And I think people who who burn out in the in the initial stages of school uh actually don't do that well later in life like let's say a person who was like okay you and then like they like they were number one in everything like academically they like burned themselves out too much during the first half of their career that in the second half of their career they aren't as ambitious or they're not as motivated uh, to learn and so I do see that in like varying degrees and in, in people as well as myself too and so I think that's pretty interesting um, and also I I've kind of seen that there are two types of orthodontists there's the clinician and then there's the business orthodontist kind of and then there are some people who like merge the two really well but oftentimes the really good orthodontists are not necessarily the best business people and really oftentimes the good business people are not necessarily good orthodontists which is surprising to me because the practices that do really really well like you would think that the orthodontist is like really really good but it it, it may not correlate sometimes so I Mm -hmm. thought that was kind of interesting too that is interesting. I'm assuming you're very good ortho- orthodontist. <laughs> no. If you're not very good at business, would you just hire someone or would you just learn more about business and like try to be yeah, both so, or how would you do that? Yeah, I know. That's a really good question because uh, I mean, I'm very confident about what I can do as a clinician, but I really think that I need more knowledge in terms of business. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I work at this practice because they do it really well. So I'm for now, I'm like, let's let the people that do it really well, do it really well. And then I'll mm-hmm. do what I do really well, do really well. Yeah. So that's my situation right now, but it may change in the future. I know it takes a lot of dedication and energy and time. So. And you kind of already said that your advice for viewers, but any other final advice you have for aspiring yeah. orthodontist and is ortho everything you thought it would be hmm interesting question um I think it's more than what I thought it would be oh that's good to that's good to hear yeah because honestly I thought oh like ortho could be really boring because you do the same thing over and over again which is true you do the same thing over and over again but if you see like a broad variety of cases, it's still really fun. And um, yes, it's, it's really fulfilling. I think that's a huge thing as well. Um, but more advice, uh, anyone who's in ortho residency right now, I would really highly encourage you to take pictures of every one of your patients at as many visits as possible, if not every visit, because that will show the progression of how teeth move and you will learn so much and do a lot of superimposition so that you could see where the teeth move. Um, If you're in like applying to orthodontics, um, I would definitely say network as much as possible with current residents, orthodontists who have uh, who have graduated, um, people who are in the admin side of the residencies so like for example chairs or program directors or even there's the secretaries um, do lots of externships as many externships as possible because this is your way to interview them kind of 
but also know that they're interviewing you at the at the externship like of course not directly but discreetly um so be because a lot of times the the programs don't actually correlate to the merit of colleges so for example um a program that i didn't know was really really good was temple like i know a graduate of temple that is an excellent orthodontist i was like really surprised so like i would never know that unless you know someone who graduated from there or you like went to go extern and you saw that you know these residents are working really really hard um, and there are some programs that you're like oh my gosh this is gonna be the best residency ever because like correlated to colleges like this is the best college ever mm -hmm. and they were like probably the most disappointing because it's like oh they go home at like two three and like so what what do they learn on a daily basis do they have that many patients um you know all of those things um and so those are things that you would never know unless you externed or you talk to someone so yeah. those are things that I really would recommend yeah great advice well You're thank welcome. you so much for doing this video podcast with me of course Thank you.